my guy Greg Allman from Fox Sports at Greg Allman everywhere. Greg, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Good. It's good to hear your voice, Jay. Thanks, buddy. Back uh, here on the Jay Retro podcast, doing a little bit of everything. We're going to talk some Buccaneers and Giants. Uh, first, let's let's go to the other sideline. Daniel Jones, like yesterday, he's reading a a a, a, a statement where it looks a, like a heartfelt message to you fans because you mean a lot to me. Oh my gosh, man. It it's it felt like like a ransom letter kind of thing, or like it was just so weird reading that. And then it's like he's not traveling with the team to Dallas for Thanksgiving. And then today he's released altogether. Like the Giants growing. I my my dad, my uncle, my grandfather always said this: like the Giants were always an organization you could be proud to be a fan of. But it's just it's kind of turned here over the last 10 years or so, and now you have this kind of dumpster fire, like, what do you make of this whole situation? And like, they were worried about the injury settlement, but now if they release him, aren't they still on the hook for his money? No. Like, how the hell does this story go down? I mean, that's the the one thing that makes sense is that he can't get hurt anymore. And that right. was the only risk. They had him supposedly lining up as a scout team safety, which I thought was like injury central. Uh, but yeah, the, the nice What's thing Baker is doing that. I was just talking about this with, uh, with Trevor Sikkim before. I think Baker is doing something similar to that in Carolina. He did. He, he lined up as a beeline. I'm not sure how active he was. Oh, you tell Baker works. to line up. He's going to line up. Swim he didn't move. Nowhere. Swim move. But I do think it's one of those where, it, and not to compare it to a divorce, but it's awkward to have somebody still living at the house if, if they're not going to be part of the future. So I, I do think there was a value in, in making a clean break. Um, they were going to pay him for the rest of the season. There's not really a financial change. You do gain a roster spot, whatever you're doing as the Giants with the 53rd spot on your roster. Um, you know, it, it's it, it once they had made the decision, they were done with him and not the backup. Um, you know, behind Tim Boyle, he's the number four. Just move on. So it, it's it's messy, but um, again, like the chaos in me wants the Cowboys to sign him on Monday yes. and play him Thursday on Thanksgiving against the Giants. Um, he, he could go somewhere. This is a lot like Baker Mayfield two years ago, where you have a guy who used to be a starter. All he wants to do is play somewhere. So now he has a chance to pick. I mean, go to Vegas. I mean, Vegas hasn't necessarily been happy with their quarterbacks. I'm not saying he's going to go out and win four games and, and flacco a team to the playoffs, but it'll be fun to see what he can do. That's so funny because I was asking, you know, where's the, you know, what's the next step for Daniel Jones? And you and Trevor said the same exact thing. Like, how great would it be for him to go to Dallas? I mean, ah, Cooper Rush, uh, let's get Daniel Jones in there here running some RPOs on Thanksgiving against that Giants team. <laughs> That's a Jerry move, Greg. That's a, it's a Jerry Jones move. Um but, you know, you look at the guy that's Tommy DeVito now, Tommy Cutlets, and I thought it was very unique to hear Sterling Shepard talk about him because he played with him, and that's a very unique perspective. And I remember because I was up in New York for the holidays during that whole time, and you know, he beat the Green Bay Packers. Like, that uh, that was not a fluke. Like, he was a good – that was a solid victory. He's tougher when he gets outside the pocket and he can use his legs a little bit, but he is what he is, right? And, and oh, yeah. if a team can figure it out, you know – when there's more tape on him, you're going to figure it out. But do the Bucks have to kind of be weary here, Greg, a little bit of, of having that that initial, that first game where you just a guy just splashes onto the scene and the Buccaneers would be the un, unfortunate recipient of a Tommy Cutlets game? I think he has to be a little bit careful just because, again, I mean, the, he'll ignite that crowd. If he comes out and right. throws a 55-yard touchdown on the first drive, the crowd is probably in play in a way it hasn't been there in a little while. Um, but, I mean – He's only had one game out of six starts where he's even thrown for 200 yards. Right. Uh, Malik Neighbors showed up with a groin injury today. He might not have him. Um, my favorite number on Tommy DeVito is he's been sacked on 17% of his dropbacks, which is just a crazy amount, one in six. Um, but, no, like I said, if you're the Bucks, they've certainly had backups and first-time starters come in and look like uh, pro bowlers against them. Um, this is a game they should win. I would have said that whether it was DJ or whether it's DeVito. Uh, I think they're trying to focus on themselves and just getting right both sides of the ball. Um, it looks like they'll have Dean and McCollum both okay. at corner, which is is definitely a step in the right direction in terms of getting healthy at a spot where they haven't been healthy. Um, you know, Mike back. I don't know that Tristan Warsh is going to play, uh, but they'll have the kind of health rebound you get after a bye week. You get closer to full strength, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, it's kind of funny when you talk about the Giants. Like their offensive line is better than last year. They they yeah. do a decent job of, you know, taking down the quarterback with sacks. But they're still one of the worst teams in football. When you're like, yeah, build through the trenches. Well, the Giants kind of have done that, and it really it just shows you how important having a good quarterback is and having you know good players in these other spots. But the Buccaneers getting these guys back due to injuries. I am McCollum returning to practice today was huge. Obviously, Mike Evans, part of the reason why I didn't put him on IR is because I thought he was going to be available for this game. But I do have concerns. Liam Cohen spoke yesterday, Greg, and I wanted to get your opinion on, all right, well, he said he's not going to run a lot of long routes. I, I, if he's not 100%, there's no reason, in my opinion, to put Mike back out there if you're going to sacrifice him not being able to be there down the stretch. So what do you make of Liam's comments about Mike Evans and what kind of 13 are we going to see on Sunday against the Giants? Right. You don't want it to be anything like the Ravens game because the Ravens game, he had whatever touchdown right away. Looked like he was hurt on the touchdown and then (laughs) goes down. You don't want to lose him for the rest of the season. So it's a little bit like works that way. I think they need him. I think they want him to play, but, Again, you, you don't you want to make sure you get the green light medically. And and Mike said today, I think Mike said he's been sorry, I got the sunlight here. No, you're good. Uh, you're shining bright like a diamond. I think Mike buddy. said he felt good last week. You know, yeah. like he felt good in the bye week, has taken it easy in practice, but I think he feels like he's back. And, and that's what you want is him to be able to run a route, be able to, you know, burst on somebody and not question the leg that's getting you there. And I think he's fine with that. I think that's one of those things where he's you know, Mike's had his share of hamstrings over the years, so it's it's definitely a delicate spot for him. But I think he's excited about, I mean, he and Jamel both, about being kind of the driving force to this seven-game push at the end of the year. Like, you know, a boost, a legit game-changing presence on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, for Mike, I mean, they, they've done a well, a pretty good job under the circumstances of continuing to at least score in the 20s right. without Evans, without Godwin. So, um Mike's had really good games against the Giants. It's probably not against his personnel necessarily, but I think he has seven touchdowns in six games in his career against the Giants. Every game he's played in the Meadowlands, he scored a touchdown in. Um, so I think he'll be happy to be back just as a let's reset, let's get some things back to normal for this team. And being able to throw to Mike Evans as kind of the what you do best on offense has been a part of that for a long time. Yeah, it's funny when people are like, oh, Mike was, you know, you could see him kind of limping around. Mike and Jameis were the same ways. They always, regardless if they're 100% healthy, they're always walking with a little bit of a hitch in their giddy up. So it's kind of tough to tell. Easy from the outside. Like, oh, yeah, I knew he was hurt. But you know that, Greg. When he walks out to practice, sometimes he's he's like doing these weird Oh, yeah. I mean, Winston last night, to watch Winston. I mean, Winston, every time he went down, got up and looked 55 years old when he got up. (laughs) Just, just. But he's been like that since he got drafted, right? Like his first year, I remember he would, he fell one time in training camp. He got up and he's going like this and everybody's like, oh my God. And 10 weeks later, he's same thing. He's just finally walking. Like he's just, he's like an old man out there. It's, it's pretty wild. Uh, that game last night still, like that's football at its best in the snow. Jameis not knowing what the hell he's going to do, throwing snowballs at people at the end. Uh, <laughs> Jameis is just one of the most unique characters I think we're ever going to see when it comes to football. Um, speaking of, of unique characters, looking at this Buccaneers team and, you know, I look at Todd Bowles as a guy that has so much love and respect around the league, but there's still concerns of like, is he that guy to take this team back to the Super Bowl? Because I know you see it too on social media, Greg. Yeah. If this team loses, he does not get any grace whatsoever. He does not get any credit. People are ready to jump off that bandwagon. But if they beat Detroit or they beat Philly, he doesn't get any of the credit. It's all about the players. What is it about Todd Bowles that people don't like? And, you know, like, where are we at with Todd Bowles, right? I mean, I don't, the Glazers don't do the whole fire thing in the middle of the season, but like, where are we at when it comes to his tenure with the Buccaneers? Where is his seat hot? Like, is it cool? Like, where are we at? Yeah, I think he's in the same spot he was this time a year ago. I mean, they were four and seven a year ago. A lot of people were upset. We're expecting him to be gone and he needed a really strong finish to be sure of where he was moving forward. And I think he's in the same spot. I mean, they're four and six now. Um, I think they know what's ahead of them in terms of the option just to have seven games. Really, six of them look very winnable, um, but they need probably six wins to be a playoff team. Um, and I think they know that. So um, in terms of fans and bowls, I mean, I think it starts with him following Bruce Arians. So I think that works against him and that as much as they're similar as coaches, I think their demeanor, how they handle things publicly, how they talk in front of a microphone are very different. So losing five out of six games, I think most people want absolute fire and brimstone, name and names, throwing people under the bus, benching people, and that's not Bowles. That's yeah. just not who he is. 
And to his credit, I think he knows that people want him to be animated on the sidelines and they want him to be swearing in post game and ripping people new ones. And that's just not who he is. He might do that in private, but he goes out of his way not to isolate anybody negatively, not to put something on any one person squarely after a loss, after a win. Um, and I think people just, I think people want heads to roll. And yeah. because he won't put somebody else under the chopping block, I think it falls on him. Their defense hasn't been good. So I think the fact that, you know, you hear Bulls about Bulls being a defensive guru or a defensive mastermind, when your defense is giving up 30 points a game, no matter how many injuries you have, people are going to throw that back at him and say, oh, wow, big game from the defensive mastermind today. Um, but again, I think the players in this locker room have not stopped caring for him and wanting to play for him. Um, again, it's a weird thing to get good at, but this team has kind of gotten good at this weird midseason swoon. Yeah. And then they flip a switch and Super Bowl year, they come out of a bye and they win a bunch in a row. I don't think this is a Super Bowl team, but I think they do have a schedule that's had them play really tough teams for the last six weeks and now play really not tough teams for the remaining seven. And if all they do is, is get healthy and take advantage of that schedule, they're going to be right back in the thick of things and be somewhere around seven and seven or eight and six with a, a week or two to go. Um, and if, especially if the Falcons stumble, they'll have something to play for in, in late December and in January. I want to ask you about the running back situation. It seems to be one of the topics that we've spoke about all year long. Um, the Bucky Irving, Sean Tucker, you can say, oh, I want to get Sean Tucker more involved. I don't think Rashad White's playing that bad where it's like you got to get rid of him, right? I mean, he's the guy that was the recipient of that incredible play by Baker Mayfield uh, against yeah. the San Francisco 49ers. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He does a good job of picking up the blitz. So I, I know people love Bucky, right? But I don't think Rashad has been that poor where it's like you got to get rid of this guy. I think one of the biggest problems is that Bucky, being the new guy, should probably maybe be running earlier on, and Rashad's strengths are of a third down back of – pass pro and <laughs> catch it on the backfield, maybe playing at the end of games. I think it's more of where, th what their strengths are compared to their roles rather than one guy being that much better than the other. Do you agree with that sentiment? Yeah. And how do you think the breakdown is going to be on Sunday? Right. No, and, and it's tricky because I mean, Rashad White's probably a top five pass catching back in the NFL right now. Right. You know, I mean, Baker trusts him immensely. They've been down a lot. And when they're down, he likes throwing to Rashad White. I forget how many, maybe five receiving touchdowns he has. He, he's done really well with that. Um, but he's also not a good traditional between the tackles runner. And they try to make him that. Obviously, the first two years, he had a ton of that with limited returns, with, with less than four yards of carry kind of returns. Bucky has been a more explosive back. Bucky's been more of a, an exciting back. I mean, you hear the fans. It's like that that Bucky cheer that mm -hmm. goes up at games. He, he he brings the crowd into it in a way that I think Rashad can do, but just doesn't as often. And then to complicate things, we're talking about those two. You have, you know, in, in Sean Tucker, you have a guy who went for 192 yards in a game and was NFC Offensive Player of the Week. Yeah. And has barely been on the field since then. I think he has 13 touches in four games since. Jeez. And Cohen, I mean, going back to like August, Liam Cohen, this was like, I might have even been Chase Edmonds in the conversation at the time, but Lo Liam Cohen was talking about how hard it is. Yeah, I remember that. Three guys in, because if you're really committed to doing that, a lot of times it means that guy that rushed for 32 yards on the last drive, you're sitting him. And you want to be able to ride the hot hand, but you also want to get all three involved. So I think the main thing that annoys people is, is seeing Tucker do as much as he did and then have games with six offensive snaps games with no touches where he wasn't even an option. Um, and again, it's a delicate thing because if anybody gets about two more carries and they both go for no yards, now you, now you play that guy too much and you yeah. don't know that one of those carries could be a 15 yard first down run. So again, I think what they're going to try and do Sunday, I, I think Rashad is still the first guy out there. I, I think you'll see Bucky on the first drive. I mean, if they, if they move the mm -hmm. chains, they're going to rotate in a fresh back. I do think you'll see more of this pony package, the the two back look that they like. That's really still a novelty package for them. That that's maybe five or six plays in a game, uh, one in the backfield, one a receiver. They'll flare one in, they'll flare one out. It's worked really well, and it it takes the defense's attention away from other people. Um, they can do that in multiple combinations. It doesn't have to just be Rashad and Bucky. It can be Bucky and Tucker. It can be mm -hmm. Tucker and White. I mean, there's there's lots of different permutations you can have. And even with Mike back, I think there's an appreciation that 
there are definitely times where having a second back on the field does you better than having a third receiver on the field, whether that's McMillan or Palmer, Ryan Miller, one of these types. Um, they haven't gotten a lot of plays out of their receiving depth. But they have gotten a lot of plays out of their running back depth. So whether they go to more 21 personnel, whether they go to plays where you, you have a running back lined up at receiver, I, I think that's something that would work well. Um, you know, the Giants have a defense that sets the quarterback really well. So this is a week where pass protection is all the more important, which probably pushes Rashad White into a bigger chunk. Right. But again, I think in terms of just getting all three involved, making sure at the end of the day, you know, you've got specific plays drawn up for all three of them. Maybe you maybe you go ahead and just say, hey, first drive of the second half, we're going to give Sean Tucker that drive, you know, and you know that going in. And whether you've rushed for 14 yards in the first half or 84, you're going to get him going. And he's going to be fresh legs and he might give you something, a, a spark that you wouldn't have if you had somebody else that they've already seen and they already kind of know how to read on coming out of the backfield. Yeah, it's a great point. I remember I looked it up uh, when I was still over at the AE. It was actually week one, week one press avails for Liam Cohen that Thursday, week one. And he was saying how difficult because it stuck in my brain of he spoke about this. He spoke like right. it's not so easy to rotate yeah. three guys in there because then you start worrying like, do I take a guy out too soon? Did I leave him in too long? Like it's just it's it's not easy, but it's it kind of happened. Rashad gets banged up. You put Sean Tucker in there. He's the NFC. This is like the worst possible scenario for him. Um, but you know, you look at that offense and the way that they've been able to play. And I, I just want to look at the defense and the pass rush. I don't know what JTS is really going to be able to give you. I mean, if he gets a sack, it's usually because the guy kind of just fell right into his lap. Yaya Diaby uh, has been really one of the more underperforming guys on this Buccaneers team this year. It's the sexy thing to say. This guy's going to be a 10 sack guy. They were saying about JTS two years ago. This guy's going to be a 10 sack guy, a 15 sack guy. Chris Braswell is going to come in and get seven or eight sacks. I mean, this has been a problem for this Buccaneers team after that year where JPP and Shaq Barrett and everybody went wild. And listen, Vita Vea, Klaja can't see. I mean, Klaja missed early on. There's always the talk of like the interior will help out the exterior, but we don't always see that in the NFL. I mean, we see guys on the outside. Like, nobody's talking about Cleveland's interior pass rush last night. They're talking about Miles Garrett getting to the quarterback, right? So I think sometimes they got to be able to show what they can bring to the table. Can they? What can they do to improve the pass rush down the stretch? I mean, other than these guys just really looking upon themselves and taking their game to the next level. I mean, I think the first thing and the simplest thing is get ahead and make teams play from behind put them in predictable passing downs, which they really haven't done a lot of, especially in the last six weeks. You get back to the first month of the season, they're getting big leads on teams. And they beat, again, teams become predictable. They get to turnovers. They get you to sacks. Uh, this Giants team is a good example. Giants are second in the NFL in sacks. Dexter Lawrence has nine. Uh, Brian Burns has six. Aziz Ojolari has six. And they're not a team that's ahead very much. It's mm -hmm. what they do best. And it's probably one of the things that the Bucks do worst is just closing deals especially from the outside pass rush. I mean, I think 28 sacks they have, and I think maybe six and a half are, are from their outside. They're edge rushers. It's a lot of, of, of Vita Vea inside. Uh, Levante David has a bunch. They've had corners and safeties that blitz. C.J. Um, Brewer. <laughs> right. C.J. Brewer had two sacks in a game. Right. right. So it's one of those where I think Bowles likes being a defense where you don't know where the pressure's coming from. So the sacks can come from anywhere. It's still nice to have them be your bread and butter, that, that things start with your edges getting in. I think, you know, to them, they really haven't had Vita Vea and Kalijah Kansi against a lesser opponent. I think they've been together now, but they've been together against Ravens, Chiefs, Niners, Falcons. So to play a team you should beat, to have both of them have a quarterback that, that tends to hold on to the ball too long. Again, Giants offensive line is better than it was a year ago, but he had nine sacks in a game last year and won it. I mean, it, it, he's going to be a guy that if, if they things go right, this should be a five sack game for the Bucks. This should be a get right game for their defense. Um, but again, you got to get there. It, it's not just pressuring it. It's, it's getting that moment. And again, not just sacks, sack fumbles, turnovers, forced fumbles, those kind of things. That's something they've sorely lacked. This hasn't been a turnover defense. This hasn't been a takeaway defense the way Bulls likes it to be. Yeah, you're right. That's some of the things that he, he hangs his hat on, including a guy like Anton Winfield Jr., another guy that really needs to take his game to the next level. At Greg Allman on all social media platforms. Check him out on Fox Sports, doing great work as always. Greg, appreciate your time, my brother. Have a great weekend. Have a good Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Same to you, man. Thanks again for having me.